York's most glamorous couple. He was rich. She was terrified she was going to lose him. A scandal that rocked society. And it was just incredible that something like this would happen. Rumors of a cover-up. She closed ranks. She kept Anne from going to jail. It was totally out of hand and wicked. It was wicked. The bombshell that blew apart New York society. Tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. October 30th, 1955, midnight. New York socialites Anne and Billy Woodward return to their Long Island mansion after a dinner party for the Duchess of Windsor. Anne and Billy are on edge. A prowler has been seen terrorizing area estates. They retire to their separate bedrooms, each armed with a shotgun, just in case the prowler decides to strike. He was really about People had seen him running, you know, and all that sort of thing. He looked in windows. Two hours later, shots ring out. Anne screams. She dials the operator, crying for the police. When I got there, detectives all over the property. And when I walked in, I ran into my detective. And he says, this is a Lulu. <laughs> And, uh, and sure enough, the door that I went in and a little bit further down, William Woodward was lying naked on the ground. I did it, Anne cries. She says she thought Billy was the prowler. I remember seeing blood on the body and on Mrs. Woodward. She was lying over the body and crying and weeping. Despite Anne's grief, detectives are already suspicious of her story. I saw him on the floor and was told that that was his bedroom and her bedroom was across the hall, a narrow hall. And I thought it rather strange that uh, they didn't sleep in the same room. It isn't just the separate bedrooms that raise eyebrows. There's a shotgun was in her room, there's a shotgun in his room and there was a handgun in his room. Then there's the position of Billy's body. He'd fallen with his head turned away from Anne. What made him look in that direction? Had he heard something suspicious, like the prowler? Or was he shielding himself from her gun? Searching for clues, police find a stockpile of ammunition in the basement, but no evidence of an intruder and no sign of forced entry. Over the next few weeks, the scandal is all over the papers. Every guest who attended that evening's party is questioned, including the Duchess of Windsor. And Anne Woodward becomes prey for the society vultures. It was a big story. She was so jealous and violent and bad-tempered and misbehaved in public, and, and Bill was a perfect gentleman and so forth. Billy Woodward's killing forces open the doors of New York's mansions and lays bare the lies of those inside. By the time the grand jury meets, the entire country wants to know, was it an accident or was Billy Woodward murdered? The Woodward story was so sensational and so shocking, it inspired me to write my novel, The Two Mrs. Grenvilles, 25 years later. Anne had quite a reputation, and Billy was from one of New York's finest families. The story begins years before and a world away. Anne Woodward was born Angeline Crowell in 1915 in Pittsburgh, Kansas. Her father, Jesse, was a struggling farmer. Her mother, Ethel, ran a taxi stand. The family was poor. But young Angie had rich ambitions. She always wanted to, you know, better herself. 
and she really worked hard at it. She had such a dream of what everything should be, what she should be. After graduating from high school, Angie worked in a junior league consignment shop. Or first time she was up close to society ladies and society young women. And she was mesmerized by the way they dressed, by their accent, by the way they moved their hands. And she was determined to imitate them and live the kind of life they were living. To Angie, that meant living in Manhattan. In 1937, she moved to New York with $400 in her pocket and the drive to become a star. Her first step was changing her name to Anne Eden. She was constantly reinventing herself. She was constantly learning. She would go to classes about giving speeches. She would go to certainly acting classes. She took dancing classes. Anne had some luck as a radio actress and model, but to make ends meet, she danced in the late night chorus line at the swank Monte Carlo nightclub. It was still in the days of the Star Club in El Morocco, and, uh, you know, people... Uh, People were cafe society. Among the Monte Carlo's regulars was William Woodward Sr., one of the wealthiest men in New York. He was president of Hanover National Bank and owned the premier thoroughbred horse farm in the country. He was a very astute and uh, gifted businessman but, and, and banker in every sense of the word. The 65-year-old Woodward also had an eye for pretty girls. One night after the Monte Carlo's 3 a.m. show, Woodward invited Ann to his table, where he'd been drinking with his shy 21-year-old son, Billy. They were what really passed for being social, and she was sort of a girl from Kansas who had clawed her way up to the chorus. But she was very pretty and very attractive. William Sr. thought so, too. When his son, Billy, was out of earshot, the elder Woodward invited the chorus girl to see one of his prized colts run at Aqueduct Racetrack. and jumped at the offer. She was determined and ambitious, and she was going to do whatever it took to get to the top, to be married to a very rich man, and to be high society. Anne may have been a gold digger, but give the girl credit. In William Woodward Sr., she'd gone right to the top. Anne had her foot in the door of New York high society. If only they knew the drama that it would lead to. After Anne Woodward shot and killed her husband, Billy, the public clamored to know how the girl from the wrong side of the tracks snagged the Manhattan millionaire in the first place. It was 1941 at a swanky nightclub that showgirl Ann Eden met William Woodward and his 21-year-old son, Billy. The Woodwards were one of New York's most prominent families. They lived in a six-story mansion and kept homes in Newport and Maryland. Billy's mother, Elsie, was one of New York's grand dames, a real blue blood who lorded over society. I mean, she was one of those people who believed, I suppose, that your name should be mentioned in the paper three times when you're born, when you're married, when you die. I remember sitting with her one day, and a lady, as she passed by the table, she said, Oh, Elsie, I'm sure uh, you'll be at the opening of the Metropolitan Opera next week. And Elsie looked at her and said, Oh, I see. No, I'm not very good at watching the lower classes cavort. <laughs> Billy's four older sisters were renowned socialites, but he was awkward when it came to dating girls of his class. At a certain point, William Woodward took a look at his son and saw him as bashful and shy and, you know, not really easy with women and suggested that he ask out Miss Eden, which Billy did. But there was a lurking secret. William Sr. never mentioned to his son that he'd had his own dalliance with Anne, an omission he'd later regret. Billy and Anne had their first date in March 1942, and soon the 21-year-old heir to millions was intoxicated by the 26-year-old chorus girl. I don't remember him really dating a lot of people or being that enthusiastic about women but he certainly was enthusiastic about Anne. He was absolutely 
crazy about her. But Elsie was not. She took an instant dislike to Billy's lower class girlfriend. It would be very difficult for someone like Anne to please Elsie that much because Elsie was, you know, she really wanted everything to be exactly right, and especially for Bill. But Mother May I wasn't Billy's game. There was nothing Elsie could do to keep him from Anne. I saw Billy and Anne at the Stork Club one night. As she got up to dance with Billy, she pulled up her strapless blue evening gown and walked to the dance floor like she owned the place. They looked like movie stars, glamorous, sexy. For Billy, there was no turning back. Anne had him hooked. In 1942, Billy enlisted in the Navy. Before shipping off to war, he proposed to Anne. But first, he wanted to ask her father for her hand. She lied and said she was an orphan. Anne wasn't going to let her lower class family get in the way. She and Billy set a March wedding date. And he calls his parents to tell them, and Elsie is furious. She wants her husband to go out and talk to William and talk him out of it, and he can't. He says things like, well, is she in the family way? We don't marry women like that. What we do is we you know, support them, we keep them. But Billy was adamant. Anne Eden and Billy Woodward were married in 1943 in Tacoma, Washington, where Billy was stationed. Only Billy's father attended. Elsie boycotted the nuptials. But the honeymoon was over before the ink was dry on their marriage license. Anne let it slip that she'd been out with Billy's father before she dated him. She swore their encounters were chaste, but the damage was done. Billy began lashing out at Anne, criticizing her every move. Over the next few months, simmering tension alternated with explosive fights. But Anne was determined to make the marriage work, and there was one surefire way to keep Billy in her grasp. She realized that he liked very much to have what they now call makeup sex. So when they would fight, they would have sex. And that was a way of her keeping him sexually attached to her, which she believed would keep him loving her. Anne became pregnant in the fall of 1943. Soon after, Billy shipped out to the South Pacific. With Anne carrying the Woodward air, her mother-in-law, Elsie, summoned her to New York to live in the family mansion. It was a crash course in how to be a Woodward. Anne studied Elsie and her high society friends, especially the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Anne thought the Duchess was the epitome of a great hostess, and she really looked at her as the supreme model, I think. And she she emulated her as much as she could. Anne gave birth to William III, nicknamed Woody, in 1944. By the time Billy returned from war the next year, he found Anne transformed into a Park Avenue socialite. But Billy wasn't happy with his new refined wife. He said, if that's what I wanted, I would have married the real thing. Anne was hurt and devastated. She would look at him across a room, and if he were looking at her, she'd be thinking, oh, oh, I better sit up straight or something like that. If he weren't looking at her, if he were looking at another lady, then she was even more upset. So there was really a no-win situation sometimes. In public, Anne tried to maintain the appearance of being happily wed. But behind closed doors, Billy's rejection sent her into a downward spiral. The forecast was a stormy one. By 1946, Ann Woodward's journey from rags to riches had landed her in the center of New York's upper crust. As the wife of Billy Woodward, she was guaranteed a prime spot in the society columns. Bill Woodward came from a family with very good background, and he had married the prototypical chorus girl. It was an Americanized descent from aristocracy. But the Woodward marriage was no fairy tale. Billy had grown restless with his socially ambitious wife and bored with their lifestyle. 
I think he was a little directionless, if there's such a word. He just had a lot of time to sit around and have a few drinks and smoke parliaments, you know, <laughs> and in bars and meeting a lot of people, you know, mostly ladies. Billy had a wandering eye, and soon an Italian princess named Marina Torlonia clouded his vision. She chased Bill like mad, and he did like that, <laughs> you know, as I think a lot of men do, and she really was after him. And uh, he, he didn't resist too much. Anne suspected something was up and hired a private investigator to follow Billy. Anne flies into a rage when she learns uh, from her detectives uh, that um, Billy is having, is having a, a pretty major affair with Marina Torlonia. She confronts him and yells at him and carries on. That was sort of not the way their social set operated. There was an awful lot of dancing, flirting, across the table, under the table, you know. Uh, that went on all the time, but she evidently didn't have any sense of humor about it. Because she was so insecure, she was frantic at any woman who looked at him or danced with him. She was just so afraid of losing him, it was sad. She did take a lot of pills because she was very high strung. Anne began relying on her medicine cabinet to deal with the stress of Billy's affair. The more pills she popped, the more erratic she became and the more desperate to keep her grip on Billy by any means. She really worked over him to keep him sexually uh, glued to her. And even when he strayed, he would always come back. In 1947, Anne gave birth to their second son, Jimmy. Elsie decreed at time Billy and his family had their own home. Anne chose a five-story townhouse on Manhattan's Upper East Side. Anne and Billy also bought this little country cottage here in Oyster Bay on the Gold Coast of Long Island. But what Anne didn't know was even though she could own the manor, she would never be to the manor born. Anne was very much the hostess um, in her own home, she thought, and she had these uh, very elegant parties, and she dressed beautifully, and the food was perfect, and she had the right musicians playing. Anne hoped her hostessing skills would win Billy's approval. But at one party, her plans backfired when the butler ushered in an uninvited guest, Marina Torlonia. Anne unleashed her fury at Billy. Anne said things about her, like she said, you're a wop whore, and so forth and so on to Billy when they were fighting. The fight lasted for days, until late one night, the shouting turned to blows. Billy hit Anne, she screamed, and a neighbor called the police. Anne didn't file charges, but Billy was already making his own plans. He told Anne he was leaving her for Marina. Within days, he'd moved out. The one that suffered the most was Anne. I think Billy kept on with his friends and so forth and so on, whereas I think Anne was, was left out. She really had very few friends. Her whole life was wound around Billy. That's the whole thing. She was totally enmeshed. Anne wouldn't give up the marriage without a fight. She hired a heavy-hitting lawyer and had him draw up a list of impossible demands. She had refused over and over to give him a divorce and wanted $2 million, which in those days was horrendously significant sum of money. Anne finally had her husband's attention. But for Billy, there was more than cash at stake. A divorce really would have taken the Woodward's name through the mill. If Billy had tried to divorce her seriously, he would have had a very difficult time because it was not as easy then in the 50s as it is today. She would have done a lot of damage to Billy. Billy dropped the divorce case and moved back home. Soon the marriage looked like it was working again. I think he realized that, my dear, I have somebody who is over the top about me. In 1952, Anne and Billy rekindled their flame on safari in India. 
During their six-week adventure, they luxuriated in unparalleled splendor. Their host, the Maharaja of Jaipur, had 400 servants waiting on them at his palace. On safari, Anne took a keen interest in guns, an interest that would spell disaster. Two years before Anne Woodward shot and killed her husband, Billy, the once turbulent marriage seemed back on track. Late in 1953, Billy's father, William Sr., died of heart disease, and Billy inherited millions in cash and stocks. He also inherited Bel Air, the family's thoroughbred horse farm in Maryland, and its prized colt, Nashua. Anne encouraged Billy's interest in Nashua. She uh, very quickly understood that this was a way for her to get in the spotlight and for him. And they're off. A small field of five is entered in the $100,000 classic. The thoroughbred captivated the sporting press and put Anne and Billy center stage. Here was a horse that brought these two together closer than they ever were before. In that horse's four legs and uh, tail and head and so forth so, were, were, were his best hopes in many ways, her best hopes in many ways. Nashua swerves to the inside. It's Nashua, the Atlantic Coast high stake winner. Nashua is one of the greatest names ever. To have owned Nashua would, would have been enough to have made you famous in all kinds of circles. All eyes on one of the greats, Nashua. Nashua racked up purse after purse. Nashua win! By October 1955, he'd won over 16 races and $750,000 in prizes, more than any other thoroughbred that year. A $75,000 victory and on to the Kentucky Derby. Billy celebrated by purchasing a new toy, an innovative and exclusive airplane called the Helio, which specialized in short takeoffs and landings. Coincidentally, the plane was built in Pittsburgh, Kansas, Anne's hometown. Billy went to Pittsburgh to pick up the plane and while there investigated Anne's background. What he discovered about her father shocked him. She had lied about her father. He was still alive and she said he was dead. Called Anne and was very taunting about this and she was very freaked. Billy accused Anne of marrying him under false pretenses, grounds for divorce according to his lawyers. On October 29th, Billy returned to Long Island, prepared to do battle with Anne. But when he got home, he faced a more urgent problem. Oyster Bay was buzzing about a prowler who'd been breaking into local estates, including his own. The Woodward's pool house had been burgled. Everyone was worried about it. People had seen him running, you know, and all that sort of thing. He looked in windows. They were all very, uh, yes, uh, you know, a little nervous uh, because everyone's house had acreage around it. One of our police officers, in fact, uh, threw a few shots at him, but he, he was a guy who, uh, he didn't care for anything. He went over a fence with shots after him. Billy became so obsessed with the prowler, he forgot about his fight with Anne. Now, all he wanted to do was catch the intruder, and Anne was thrilled to play along. They're whipping each other up about the prowler. And they're walking around and speaking in French because they think the prowler is right nearby and maybe he'll hear them. Nothing could take their minds off the lurking villain. Not even a party that night for the Duchess of Windsor at a neighboring estate. Billy and Anne walk around the party speaking of the prowler. Anne and Bill were the two that were the most excited about it. Everyone knew about him. You know, certainly everybody at the party. 58 guests showed up at the dinner party for the Duchess that night, and they all got a taste of high drama. Billy's latest fling phoned him at the party. Anne overheard them and hurled a crystal goblet at his head. A little after midnight, Anne and Billy returned to their estate. Driving home, where there may be a prowler waiting. One feels that kind of thing, and Anne was feeling very definitely that she was being looked at. Each took a shotgun to their separate bedrooms. 
Anne placed hers by a chair next to her bed. In his room across the hall, Billy did the same. He also placed a handgun on a table near his bed. Around 2 a.m., Anne awoke with a start. She jumped from her bed, grabbed her shotgun, flung open her bedroom door, and fired two shots at a shadowy figure across the hall. Investigators rushed to the estate. From Anne's phone call, they were sure the infamous Prowler had been inside the playhouse. Did the Prowler do it? Did that man who's been around here, did he do it? And she said, no, I shot him. I thought it was the Prowler. Detectives tried to question Anne in her bedroom. She was sobbing, absolutely sobbing. Every time you mentioned something that struck a nerve, she'd stop and start to cry again. The nurse was brought in to sit with Anne because she kept talking about how she was going to kill herself. And the nurse saw all these bottles of pharmaceuticals around, and the nurse became very nervous and picked them all up and put them in a bag. And Anne said, no, no, don't take the pills. It wasn't only Anne's pill habit that troubled investigators. There was something about her story that didn't sit right with them. There was a, a certain aura about the house that uh, was eerie. But then I saw him on the floor and was told that that was his bedroom and her bedroom was across the hall. And I thought it rather strange that they didn't sleep in the same room. Did she intend to kill this man, or did she, by circumstance, accidentally shoot him? Logic would say, why, why, why fire at that particular moment? Why don't you wait and see who it is? You're the one who has the weapon. But it is extraordinary that she fired at him twice without even asking who he was in a house where her children could have been sleepwalking or the butler could have been out and about. Anne's bedclothes were also puzzling. I noticed that she was wearing a bra. I thought that this was an unusual display of modesty at a time when she was hysterical and supposedly incoherent, that she would stop and put a bra on and then put her night, uh, nightgown on and her negligee. In the midst of all the mayhem, Anne managed to phone her attorney. Enter Sal Rosenblatt. The lawyer rich people called back then when they got into big trouble. He convinced local DA Frank Gulata that poor Ann needed to rest. So instead of a night in a Long Island jail, she was checked into Manhattan's fanciest hospital. Assistant DA William Kahn was shocked at how easily the Woodward name had greased the wheels. We had the killer. We had the dead body, uh, and it just surprised me a little bit that Frank Galata permitted uh, her to go to a private hospital without placing her in custody. We have no further comment to make. I think I'd be naive to say that there wasn't preferential treatment, and probably because of her station in life. Anne was safe from jail for the time being. But enduring a police investigation would be nothing compared to the more treacherous ordeal ahead of her, facing her mother-in-law. October 31st, 1955, Elsie Woodward awoke to the news that her daughter-in-law, Anne, had killed her son, Billy. It confirmed for Elsie all of her bad feelings about Anne from the past. She's quite sure that Anne did it on purpose. She's quite sure of that. Uh, mostly because Anne was from the wrong side of the tracks. To Elsie's horror, the press already had a hold of the story. Coast to coast, headlines called it the shooting of the century. Anne and Billy's contentious marriage was served up to a hungry public. While Anne was secluded in a Manhattan hospital, the country debated her guilt or innocence. Economist Igor Cassini, a friend of Billy's, all but demanded Anne's indictment. He always comes back to her jealousy, her jealous temperament, her kind of gold-digging temperament. The press was harsh, but New York society ladies were even harsher. They never liked Anne to begin with. And when those ladies turned on you, you were done for. They had Anne for lunch. I mean that in a way that was not 
terribly nice. I mean, there were people who said better that she shot Billy than Nashua. You know, things like that. I mean, really shocking things. It was discussed at every party. It was, did she do it, and blah, 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 and lots of gossip and details and stuff, and people having the inside word, and, you know, the butler told them such and such. Meanwhile, investigators grilled the Woodward's friends and family about the couple. Billy's sister, Libby, chimed in about how dangerous Ann was with a shotgun. She brought up the fact that Ann Woodward was a terrible shot. And she says, when we hunted tigers, we were all afraid of her handling of a gun. And I remember Steve Pinnell, chief of detectives, asking her, oh, you uh, hunted tigers? And I kid you not. Her answer was, doesn't everybody? In the meantime, Nassau County police continued hunting for the mysterious prowler. We had surmised that he was doing burglaries here, stealing cars. Then, three days after the shooting, police spotted a stolen car outside a Long Island diner. Inside, they saw jewelry, knives, and guns. When the driver returned, the cops pounced. The man was German immigrant Paul Wirths. We told him that we had certain evidence to tie him in with burglaries. We did have prints. I really didn't know if they were his, but we had pretty well convinced him that we could tie him in because he started to cooperate with us. Worth admitted to breaking into the Woodward pool house, but that was all. He said he knew nothing about a shooting. But one hard-nosed detective didn't believe him. Frank Steiner, who was a German-speaking policeman, said to him, for Christ's sake, you know, there's, there's a woman and two children involved. You should tell the truth. So Paul Worth then said, yes, I was there that night. Paul Worth described to us how he climbed this tree when he broke a limb off the tree. And he said he went in through an open door into the second story, went inside, he was into this closet, and he says, I saw a safe there. And he says, oh, I wasn't interested in safe, but then he says, while I'm moving around, he says, I heard this shot. And he says, I dropped, got out. On November 2nd, 1955, 900 mourners said goodbye to Billy Woodward at St. James Episcopal Church in Manhattan. 20 black limousines parked in front of the church. Spectators filled the streets. Elsie didn't permit Anne to attend. She did allow Anne to contribute the flowers for the casket. Anne chose red and white carnations, the colors of Nashua's racing silks. Meanwhile, the press was breathing down the DA's neck. He called for a grand jury to convene. But with Elsie Woodward in their way, could they ever get at the truth? Like everyone else, I was dying to know what really happened here that night. But no one was talking. We'd all have to wait for the hearing and the biggest performance of Anne's life. On November 21st, 1955, three weeks after the shooting, Anne Woodward left Doctor's Hospital for the first time. The national press greeted her with a storm of flashbulbs. You know, it was a field day with the news media. Everybody trying to get shots of her and trying to ask her questions. Anne's first stop was the Nassau County Courthouse on Long Island. Mrs. Woodward is completely broken up now. We're... She fought her way through another gauntlet of photographers, then submitted to a three-hour pre-grand jury interrogation by the DA. This evidently has been quite a session for Mrs. Woodward. She's just been escorted out, and this time we were unable to get even to the attorney. Afterwards, she was summoned to Elsie's mansion in Manhattan. The Woodward matriarch had her lawyers read Billy's will to her son's killer. Anne could keep the houses in New York and Oyster Bay. She would also receive a pension as Billy's widow. But Elsie wanted something in return. Elsie was a cool cucumber. The only thing that really concerned her was the Woodward family name. Elsie was determined to get the Woodward grandsons under her thumb. 
She did not want Anne um, to be tried as a murderess. And she believed that she was covering up a murder. Backed into a corner, Anne agreed to let her mother-in-law send her sons away to a fancy Swiss boarding school. Mrs. Woodward still maintained her dignity. She never, ever said one word against Anne. She just closed her ranks and her friends closed ranks. And it wasn't nice to talk about it and to speculate as to whether Anne killed Bill Woodward on purpose. On November 25th, the grand jury began its inquiry into the killing of Billy Woodward. Among the first to testify were the police officers who were on the scene the night of the shooting. They presented ballistics reports, crime scene photos, and the double-barreled shotgun Ann used to kill Billy. The grand jury hearing was an elegant affair. Many people who'd been guests at the dinner for the Duchess showed up as they waited in the halls to testify. It was more like a cocktail party than a trial. Guests from the Duchess's party filed in one by one. Surprisingly, they offered rosy views of Anne and Billy's relationship. It was like, oh, they were a happy couple. Oh, they were a wonderful couple. Oh, this is a terrible accident. Tension built steadily throughout the long day in anticipation of Anne's testimony. Paul Wirths told his latest version of breaking into the playhouse. The tree branch he'd allegedly snapped that night was exhibited as evidence. Finally, Anne was ushered in. Her appearance shocked everyone. She came into the grand jury looking like her own grandmother. She was all in black placed her in the chair and she was sworn in and the testimony began and struggled through the questioning she told the same story she'd given investigators she heard a noise thought it was the prowler and pulled the trigger she cried she sobbed as a matter of fact we stopped for a while and a, one of the grand jurors was a nurse brought her some water and asked if she needed help. No, she testified coherently. Over two hours later, Anne was finished. Her fate was in the jury's hands. They reached their verdict in less than half an hour. Billy Woodward was killed in an accidental shooting. Anne was not found guilty of anything except being lower class, not our kind. And the people who th thought she'd done it on purpose, of course, said, well, it was the Woodward money and the position that kept her out of jail. Anne returned to her townhouse in Manhattan. A month later, she went out for the first time. I was walking along Madison Avenue, window shopping, and she was coming toward me. I mean, I saw someone dressed in total black and, and I, I looked at her and, of course, knew her, and I said, how, you know, darling Anne, how are you? And she said, I will never recover, ever, ever, ever. Anne went into seclusion and was rarely seen in public until a few years later when Elsie reached out and invited her to a party. Elsie was hosting the April in Paris ball at the Waldorf Astoria. When Anne approached the Duchess of Windsor, her former idol looked right through her. It was the snub of a lifetime, and Anne was finished. Those ladies turned into piranhas. They really were after her terribly. They were just feeling that she had blown apart a whole family. Anne remained fodder for gossip for nearly 20 years. In 1975, Truman Capote penned a short story about a former prostitute who murders her husband, a thinly veiled dig at Anne. People just feel, oh, well, that was pretty mean what he did to Anne Woodward, but she probably deserved it because she murdered her husband. Anne was despondent when she heard that Capote's story was going to be published in Esquire magazine. On the evening of October 9th, 1975, Anne dismissed her servants and retired to her bedroom. She got herself all dressed up in her best 
finery, I suppose, and put on her makeup and put her, don't forget, little tablet where she wrote notes to herself about her various luncheon engagements and so on, wrote Anne Woodward, and then took a cyanide pill. She was discovered the next morning by her maid. I can't say I was surprised. I just knew she was so woefully unhappy for so long. Anne's sons, Woody and Jimmy, seemed cursed by their parents' fate. 11 months after Anne's suicide, 29-year-old Jimmy jumped to his death from a hotel window on Central Park South. 23 years later, Woody reprised his brother's suicide and jumped from a window ending his own life. Billy, Anne, and their two boys had all met tragic ends. The only one who was really had was able to come out of it, pull herself up with her bootstraps, is the aging lioness, Elsie. She made her life go on, and she did it very well. She was a strong, strong woman. She had to be. Elsie Woodward lived to age 98. At the heart of this tragedy is perhaps um, the American dream turned into a really snobbish nightmare. You know, Anne didn't spend a day in jail. Anybody else, if this had happened, they would have carted her off to jail, but they hired a nurse. There's something in every society that needs a class to look up to, to envy, to hate, to want to destroy them or to want to be like them or to want to get to be one of them. And it's unending. It's like Macbeth, let's face it. I mean, murder most foul. The Woodward murder had allowed everyone to peek inside the world of the very rich. It was a place where ambition led to tragedy and money influenced justice. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn. Yeah.